You know what's terrifying? We've been dreaming about reaching the stars for thousands of years. We built rockets, landed on the moon, and sent probes into the void. But here's the brutal truth. Our fastest spacecraft would take 73,000 years to reach the nearest star. And that's not changing, ever. Let me show you why. When we talk about leaving the solar system, we're not talking about Mars missions or asteroid mining. We're talking about crossing to another star, a journey so vast that the entire span of recorded history wouldn't be long enough to complete it with the technology we have today. Proxima Centauri, the nearest star to our sun, sits 4.2465 light years away, which is approximately 25 trillion miles. Voyager 1 is currently moving at 38,027 miles per hour, or 17 kilometers per second. At that velocity, it would take over 73,000 years to reach Proxima Centauri if it were headed in that direction. 73,000 years. That's longer than humans have been farming. That's 2,900 generations. The pyramids were built less than 5,000 years ago. Modern humans emerged around 300,000 years ago. This single journey would consume a quarter of our entire existence as a species. Most people underestimate interstellar distance because science fiction has trained us to see space as navigable. Ships jump between stars in hours or days. But reality doesn't compress for narrative convenience. The space between stars isn't an obstacle waiting for better technology. It's a fundamental barrier written into the structure of space-time itself. And it gets worse because even if we built something a hundred times faster than Voyager, we'd still be talking about journeys measured in centuries. Here's why speed itself becomes the enemy. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second, the universal speed limit, yet light still takes 4.2 years to reach Proxima Centauri. Our fastest spacecraft, the Parker Solar Probe, achieved 430,000 miles per hour in December 2024. At that speed, it would take approximately 6,700 years to reach Proxima Centauri. Even if we tripled that speed, we're still talking about multi-thousand year timescales. And as you approach significant fractions of light speed, physics imposes costs that compound exponentially. To reach 10% of the speed of light, which would get you to Proxima in 42 years, you need energy outputs that dwarf anything humanity has ever produced. The fuel required would exceed the spacecraft's mass by thousands of times, and that fuel must be accelerated too, requiring more fuel. It's the tyranny of the rocket equation, and there's no engineering workaround. Chemical rockets have a hard ceiling on energy output. Nuclear thermal propulsions offer better efficiency, but even optimistic projections would only cut journey times from tens of thousands of years to thousands. Fusion drives sound promising, Antimatter propulsion appears in academic papers, but fusion power, after 70 years of research, still consumes more energy than it produces. We can't make it break even on Earth, let alone miniaturize it for deep space. Antimatter exists only in microscopic quantities at enormous cost. Producing enough to fuel an interstellar mission would require energy greater than total human civilization output, sustained for decades. Some proposals involve laser propulsion, using ground-based lasers to push lightweight solar sails. Project Breakthrough Starshot aims for 20% light speed with gram-scale probes, but scaling this to carry humans, life support, radiation shielding, and deceleration systems, you'd need a significant fraction of our sun's total power output, sustained and focused for years. But let's assume for a moment we solve propulsion. Let's say we build a ship capable of reaching 10% light speed, now we face a different problem. Physics doesn't care about our ambitions. At high velocities, microscopic particles become lethal. A grain of sand at 10% light speed carries energy equivalent to dynamite. Interstellar space contains hydrogen, helium, and dust. At relativistic speeds, your spacecraft gets sandblasted by impacts that vaporize conventional materials. You'll need thick forward shielding. That adds mass. More mass needs more fuel. More fuel adds more mass. The cycle compounds endlessly. And deceleration, that requires just as much energy as acceleration. You're carrying fuel for the entire journey there and back, doubling your mass requirements. Then there's degradation. Electronics fail. Seals wear out. Materials become brittle under radiation. A thousand-year mission needs self-repairing systems or onboard manufacturing. 
you're not building a spacecraft. You're building a mobile industrial civilization that must function autonomously longer than any human institution has existed. Even at 10% light speed, requiring revolutionary breakthroughs, a round trip to Proxima Centauri would take 80 to 100 years minimum. That's three to four generations. The crew would never see Earth again. Their children would be born in space. Their grandchildren would die in space. This isn't a spacecraft. It's a civilization requiring governance, culture, education, and conflict resolution. You'd need people born halfway through who never chose this mission, never knew Earth, and will never see the destination to remain committed to continuing it. We've studied isolation in Antarctic bases, submarines, and the ISS. Humans struggle with prolonged isolation and monotony. Depression and conflict becomes inevitable. Now extend that to lifetimes. There's no rescue, no early return, no escape. The human body wasn't built for space. In microgravity, astronauts lose 1 to 2% of bone mineral density every month. Weight-bearing bones can lose 10% of their mass over six months in space. Muscle atrophy results in 10 to 20% muscle loss on short missions. Without aggressive countermeasures, that could reach 50% on long flights. Astronauts returning from six-month ISS missions show bone loss comparable to severe osteoporosis. We've studied these effects for months. What happens after five years, 10, 50 in zero gravity? We don't know because no human has tried. And reproduction, no human has ever been conceived, gestated, or born in space. Rat studies in microgravity show cardiac anomalies, balance issues, and neurological defects. If we can't raise healthy children in space, multi-generational missions are biologically impossible. Beyond bone and muscle loss, there's radiation, cosmic rays, high energy particles from dying stars constantly bombard everything in space. On Earth, our atmosphere and magnetic field shield us. In space, there's no protection. Long-term exposure increases cancer risk, damages DNA, accelerates aging, and impairs the nervous system. Current shielding reduces exposure, but doesn't eliminate it, and it adds mass. Over decades in interstellar space, the cumulative damage becomes catastrophic. DNA mutations, cellular breakdown, neurological impairment is severe enough to compromise mission-critical decisions. So we can't go fast enough. We can't survive long enough. Our bodies break down. But even if we solved all of that, there's one more barrier most people never consider. At interstellar distances, communication becomes nearly impossible. A message from Proxima Centauri takes 4.2 years to reach Earth. A question and answer over eight years. By the time mission control responds to an emergency, the crew has either solved it or died. There's no real-time support, no updates, no corrections. The mission must be autonomous from launch. The travelers leave Earth in 2025, arrive in 2105. Everyone they knew is dead. Languages, politics, technology, everything has changed. They're not explorers. They're refugees from a world that no longer exists. It would be easy to see these limitations as a failure, as proof that humanity is trapped, destined to fade on a single world. But that's the wrong way to look at it. Understanding our limits doesn't diminish us. It clarifies what we are. We're a species adapted to one planet in one solar system. And that's not a cage, it's a home. The solar system itself is vast. Mars holds mysteries. Europa may harbor life beneath its ice. Titan's methane lakes remain untouched. Enceladus shoots water plumes from a subsurface ocean. We've barely explored any of it. We don't need to leave the solar system to be explorers. The universe isn't telling us we're too small. It's telling us we're exactly the right size for the stage we occupy. The stars will remain out of reach, not because we lack vision or courage, but because physics is indifferent to ambition. The distances are too vast. The energy requirements are too steep. The timescales are too long. The human body is too fragile. We've walked on the moon. We've sent probes beyond the solar system's edge. We've built incredible things. But the gap between possible and probable is where reality lives. This isn't defeat, it's clarity. The solar system is our home, not our prison. Maybe the dream of reaching the stars was never about physically arriving. Maybe it was always about looking up, understanding how improbable our existence is, and recognizing that some boundaries exist not to be crossed, but to be respected. 
we live on a world that orbits a stable star in a quiet galaxy region. Water exists in liquid form. An atmosphere shields us from radiation. The temperature remains within the narrow band where chemistry supports complexity. Traveling to Proxima Centauri at Voyager speed would be like crossing the Sun to Pluto distance nearly 3,000 times. Even light takes over four years for that journey. We are exactly the right size for the world that gave us life. If this changed how you think about humanity's place in the cosmos, there's more to explore. The universe is full of uncomfortable truths about distance, time, and the limits written into physics itself. Subscribe if you want more honest conversations about space and the boundaries of human exploration. And if this resonated with you, share it with someone who still believes we'll be colonizing Alpha Centauri in their lifetime. What do you think? Are we destined to stay in the solar system forever? Or will future breakthroughs prove these limits wrong? Drop your thoughts in the comments.